going, church? How's it going, everyone? Hey, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for joining us. And just a Godspeed to all of those marathon runners today. Has anyone already finished running today? Come on, Hannah. Come on, we love you. Thank you for running on behalf of our church. Thank you for running because I never will. All right? So, <laughs> whew, this body don't run. All right. Well, Thanks for being here today. My name is Chris Kong. I'm one of the pastors here. And we're just so thankful that you're here today. I want to start off my message today with just a quick question. When is the last time that you prayed? I'll give you a second to think about that. When's the last time you prayed? You might not have even realized that you were praying at the time. And just the other day when we were leaving our house for school, I prayed a prayer that went kind of like this. Jesus, please let my daughter, Indy, Put on her socks and shoes today. <laughs> yes, Lord, we need that. Four-year-olds, you know. Lots of people pray for all different kinds of reasons. Today, you might have been praying, Lord Jesus, would you give me a parking spot? I know that those are at a premium here at Coastline. I'm going to pray this prayer over you right now. May God give you great parking as you come to Coastline Church. We need that, right? Come on. You know, in our current series, There is Life Here, we've been studying the book of Acts in the early church, and we've seen how they modeled life-giving, vibrant, spirit-driven church. And one thing we learned from the early church is that they were devoted to prayer. They're devoted to prayer. We're going to get into Acts 2.42. It's our text for this series. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is the early church. If you're taking notes today, the title of my message is Devoted to Prayer. Devoted to Prayer. We're going to be focusing on this fourth pillar of the early church as recorded by Luke, the writer of Acts. So I want to start my message with a prayer. Can we do that? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're here right now. Would you speak to us? Would you move in our hearts? Help us to know that you are our lifeline. You are there for us in every moment. And we thank you for that today, Lord Jesus. Have your way in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to start with just a simple definition of prayer. When I talk about prayer today, I'm saying we're simply talking to God. We're inviting Jesus into our everyday moments, allowing his presence to surround us as we draw closer to him. And the heart of what I want to share with you today is this. Prayer is a lifestyle centered on being with Jesus Depending on him is our lifeline and sharing in his fragrance. And that might not make a lot of sense to you right now, but it will by the end of this message, okay? We're going to share in his fragrance. When we look at the book of Acts, what we see is that time and time again, the early church was devoted to inviting Jesus into their moments. From the time Jesus was taken up to heaven, the apostles waited in an upper room for the Holy Spirit to come, as Jesus promised that he would. And when it comes to this report of the church's activities in Acts 2.42, it's clear that the early church had four major things they were devoted to. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread. Who's going home tonight to break some bread? Come on, Thanksgiving, get that pumpkin pie. That's not bread, but it's still good. And of course, prayer, right? They were devoted to prayer. And when we mention the word devoted in this series, we really mean to continue steadfastly with intense effort, even in the face of difficulty. Against all odds, the church continued a steadfast, intense effort towards intentional spiritual connection with God. Prayer was a hallmark of Christians in the early church. And what we learn from these passages is life-giving churches pray. And life-giving Christians pray. And we're going to spend some time in the book of Acts today, chapter 3 and 4 in a minute. And what we're going to see from these passages is that there were three beliefs that the early church held about prayer. The early church had something to teach us about prayer. There's something for you here today. The first belief they held is that prayer is a lifestyle. Prayer is a lifestyle. I want to go back for a minute to the first couple chapters of Acts, and I encourage you, if you haven't read through the book of Acts, it's a great place to start. Read through the book of Acts. It's the story of the, the early church. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on the apostles and those in the upper room. They started speaking in all different kinds of tongues, and Peter got up to speak to a crowd of, three, of thousands of people, and 3,000 people were saved. 
right after this, we get that report that I just read from Acts 2.42. And this passage really serves as an introductory summary of what's happening in the, this section of the book of Acts. They devoted themselves to the teaching and to prayer and breaking of bread. But I want to spend our time today on the account just after Peter preached to the people in Acts chapter 3. We'll start at verse 1 and go to verse 8. Are you ready, church, coastline? Come on. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to, into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Wow. What a miracle. A lot could be said about this passage and the miracle that we see performed here, but I really want to focus on one simple detail today. Peter and John were on their way to pray. Week after week, day after day, the apostles patterned their lives on going to prayer at 3 p.m. It's like they had alarms set on their Apple watches and they would hear the ding at like 2.50, it's time to go to prayer, and they would head over to the temple to pray, right? But this time it was different, wasn't it? This time, Peter and John had something to offer the beggar that would change his life forever. And as I read this passage, I asked myself, how did Peter know that today was the day to bring this miracle? Could it be that on this day, Peter's prayers aligned his schedule with God's plan and purpose to heal this beggar? God knew that at just before 3 p.m., because they would have been on time, right? Peter and John would have been walking by the gate called Beautiful, and the Spirit of God spoke to Peter, and in the absence of coins, an encounter with Jesus happened. Isn't it interesting that our lack of resources can open up a window for God's Spirit to move in a powerful way? All of this happened because Peter lived a lifestyle of prayer that started with Jesus, he was connected to Jesus and his spirit. He was a man of prayer. I was thinking about our culture today and the world's pursuit of different lifestyles. Maybe you know someone who's into minimalism. Minimalists are people who desire simplicity by reducing their material possessions. They try to focus on what's most important to them. They're particular to accumulate only things that bring meaning to their lives, right? And oftentimes you'll go to their house and they have... Big houses with sparse but functional and beautiful furniture, right? I have a friend just like this. Maybe you know someone who lives off the grid, or maybe you don't because they're off the grid. Right? <laughs> People who live off the grid live in self-sufficient homesteads, and typically they live far away from civilized areas. They grow their own food. They may collect rainwater. They may have solar panels. They are prepared for the worst because they don't want to depend on the wrong systems. Maybe you know some Christians. The Christian lifestyle is wrapped around being and becoming more like Christ every single day. Loving like Christ loved. Forgiving like he forgave. Praying like he prayed. There's nothing wrong trying to live a certain kind of lifestyle just as the minimalists focus on what's important to them and just as a person who lives off the grid doesn't want to depend on the wrong systems, Christians use prayer to focus on what's most important. And they look to Jesus so that they don't depend solely on the systems of the world. What's most important for Christians is that our lifestyle gives us a deep meaningful connection with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need that. And when we think about the early church and the way that they lived, we see that they devoted themselves to prayer. They didn't see prayer as an optional practice. They didn't pray on certain, just certain occasions or when life got tough or just on Christmas and Easter. They incorporated prayer into all kinds of moments in their lives. Prayer wasn't their last resort. 
It wasn't a Hail Mary pass. It was their first response. And the same is true for us today. Prayer isn't an optional extra for Christians. It's the key to a vibrant, life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you today. If you were to examine your lifestyle, your Christian lifestyle, the way that you live, would it resemble Jesus' lifestyle? How about Peter and John's lifestyle? What if God wanted to use you to change someone's life forever? Would you be available? Just one little interruption changed that man's life. See, this miracle didn't surprise Peter because he was connected to the source of that miracle. To Peter, prayer was a part of his lifestyle. It was ingrained in him, a habit that he would never shake. So I ask you, is prayer a part of your Christian lifestyle? And if it is, this is your reminder, keep it up. It's awesome, it's vibrant, right? And if it isn't, I want you to ask yourself, why not? What are some of the common barriers to us praying and Trust me, the ones I'm going to list, I've, I've dealt with all of these in my life at some time. We all know that life can get full and chaotic. We're busy. It's hard to fit prayer in. Maybe our expectations get in the way. You might be thinking, man, if I don't have 30 minutes to pray today, I might as well not do it. I'm not going to get into it, right? Or there's always the problem of unanswered prayers. It hurts when we don't receive exactly the answer that we wanted, And what I want to say to all of these objections is, a lifestyle of prayer doesn't mean that you've perfected prayer. We're not perfect prayers. A lifestyle of prayer is one that accepts the invitation to pray again when we falter. And in my own life, I've felt so guilty when I've neglected prayer. And not just because I'm a pastor, okay? I would feel so defeated and I would think to myself, If I haven't been praying, then why should I keep up with it at all? And I was reminded recently that the cure to prayerlessness is simply to pray. It's as simple as that. Why wouldn't we want to connect with Jesus and his life-giving spirit through prayer? And if you feel guilty because you haven't prayed before or it's been a while, the best way to make it through that barrier today is to simply just start to pray. God, I'm here. I know you're here too. You know, Jesus loves you so much. He wants to surround you with his presence. You don't have to feel guilty when you come to him. The Bible actually encourages us to pray. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it says this, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What a great verse for us on Thanksgiving weekend, right? Pray continually. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And prayer is a lifestyle. We are working to build consistency. But remember this about prayer. We are always learning, always growing, never mastering. Can I say it again? We're always learning, always growing. We never master prayer. So don't feel guilty. Like the disciples, we can continue to ask Jesus, teach me how to pray. I had a mentor several years ago. She shared her journey with me. She prayed for her husband for 21 years before he came to Christ. Think about how long her prayers were left unanswered. Think about her tears or her frustration. Think about the way she would invite others to pray for him as well. What never changed was her determination to keep praying. And against all odds, she continued to pray steadfastly with intense effort, even in the face of difficulty. And lo and behold, 21 long years later, her husband came to know Jesus Christ, and he still serves him today. It's amazing. You know, she believed just as the early church believed, prayer is a lifestyle. So that's the first belief that they believed. The second belief that the early church held is that prayer is our lifeline. Prayer is our lifeline. When it comes to all the situations and circumstances of our lives, the early church showed us that prayer is a lifeline. It's our best defense in times of triumph and trials. Let's head back into the story of Peter and John for a second. They demonstrate the miracle of healing this lame man. The crowd becomes captivated by them, and Peter takes the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people. 
And you know what happened? It made the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the religious leaders greatly disturbed. They're very upset, especially because they were preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they had Peter and John arrested and dragged into the courts. Acts 4, verse 7, we'll pick it up there. Then they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Look at what happens next. We'll skip to verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Peter and John, unschooled, ordinary men, nothing notable about them. They were just normal guys, just like you and just like me. And if there were ever a time to underline something in your Bible, I would underline verse 13 where it says, these men had been with Jesus. Jesus. The authorities were astonished. These were the same people who had Jesus put on trial and crucified. They knew that Peter and John had literally been with Jesus. They saw them in the temple courts. They knew they were his disciples. But what they didn't know is that after Jesus died, Jesus' lifestyle would live in and through them in the future. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. What a compliment. You and I can only hope and pray that people would say the same thing about us, that we'd been with Jesus. How did Peter carry the lifestyle of Jesus with him? Look at what it says in Acts 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Peter had a lifeline the Holy Spirit living within him, gave him the words to save the religious leader. He was clearly an unschooled man, but he was able to come toe-to-toe with the religious leaders just like Jesus did. And it was because the same spirit that empowered Jesus, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, also lived in Peter. I have a friend, I see this person a few times a year, and he's a pastor as well. I dearly love this guy, and the first thing we do when we see each other is we go for a big hug. And every time I hug him, we have a long chat, and when we part ways, I realize something. His cologne has transferred onto me as a result of that hug. It's his signature smell, like the Dracar Noir. It's like pirate beard or something. It just smells really manly, you know? (laughs) There's no mistaking this smell. And when I smell that fragrance, I know that I've been with him. And when I get a breeze of that smell as it goes by, I know he's been by me, right? Look at what 2 Corinthians 2.15 says. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and those who are perishing. When we spend time with Jesus in his presence as we pray, as we communicate with him, as we live a lifestyle of prayer, it's like we've had that big embrace with him and his smell begins to transfer onto us. And the more we meet with him, the more we have that signature fragrance, that smell. When people hear you speak and when people experience you, can they smell it? The fragrance that you've been with Jesus, when you're having a tough time with your boss or your coworkers, that never happens to me, by the way. (laughs) How can you respond with kindness and grace? We need the fragrance of Jesus. When you're facing hardship in your life, how is your faith built up? And when you've got more months than you've got money, how can you have hope that God will provide for you? It's in these moments that we're thankful for Jesus' presence within us, his spirit, because prayer prepares our hearts for what's to come. And prayer gives us the confidence we need to face all of the troubles of life. Because every time we pray, we've been with 
Jesus. You need to hear that today. Every time you pray, every little prayer, you've been with Jesus. And when it comes to the apostles defending their faith, their lifestyle, their relationship with the resurrected Jesus Christ, prayer was their response to their trials and trouble. It really was their lifeline. They needed it. And that's the second belief that the early church held. And the final belief today is that the early church believed that prayer transforms our hearts and our situations. Prayer transforms our hearts and our situations. In the account today in Acts 3 and 4, Peter and John face those religious leaders. They have their defense, and the religious leaders don't really know what to do with them. They command them actually to not speak or teach in Jesus' name any longer. And what Peter and John say to their faces is that, you know what, we're not going to stop speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard. But guess what happens? They're released with no punishment. It's amazing. But look at what happens as soon as they're released. Acts 4.23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Verse 24, I love this. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Come on. They didn't get worked up. They didn't rage post on their blogs or spread rumors. They didn't plot revenge or head back with pitchforks. They prayed. And this is what they prayed. It's right here in verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Did you notice the content of their prayer? They didn't pray for a relief from the opposition. They didn't curse the religious leaders. They prayed for more boldness to proclaim Jesus. And I want us to think about our own lives for a minute. We might not be able to change all the negative things that are happening in our lives or affect them all that much, but we can always ask God for more boldness to proclaim how good he is in the midst of it. Prayer can really transform you from the inside out. What's going on in your life right now? What needs do you have? Could it be that you could pray the same prayer that the early church prayed that day? Would you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus? I pray that over you today, that God would meet you right where you are, no matter what the situation, that he would reach into your life and heal you or perform a sign or a wonder in his son Jesus' name in your life. Thank you, Lord. The early church believed that prayer can transform our hearts and transform our situations. You know, when I was seven or eight years old, I was learning. I remember learning about the power of prayer. I was at my grandparents' house at the time. It was the dog days of summer. It was super hot. And in my mind at the time, there's really only one way you can get rid of heat, right? It's like you got to run through the water, right? So I ran to go get a sprinkler from the garage. It was one of those rainbow ones. You know, it goes like this. You know, all the way back and all the way forward. Okay, just me. I use one of those anyways. So I hooked it up to the hose and I cranked it to 11 and as high as it was go and I, I ran through it several times and as I was running through the sprinkler, I must have got the attention of the neighborhood kids because they called out to me and asked if I wanted to play hockey. And I didn't know anything about road hockey, but I was happy for the invitation nonetheless. I toweled off quickly and like a true Canadian, I went to go play some road hockey. And suddenly about 15 or 20 minutes later, I thought to myself, oh no, I left the sprinkler on and I dropped my hockey stick and ran back to the house and to my shock, I had placed the sprinkler so that it was spraying directly into an open window. <laughs> my uncle's bedroom window. I felt the blood leave my face and if you knew my uncle at the time, you'd know that he was a very serious kind of grumpy young adult. Luckily, he wasn't home at the time. But I didn't know when he was going to be back. And I ran to my grandma all flustered. I said, the sprinkler, the window is spraying in his room. What am I going to do? 
And she kneeled down to my level, just ready for the answer. And she said to me, you better go pray. (laughs) Shut yourself in the bathroom and pray that God would soften his heart. If God can soften Pharaoh's heart, he can soften your uncle's heart too. So I did it. I ran as fast as I could to the bathroom. I slammed the door. I kneeled to the tub and I just cried out to God, soften his heart, Jesus. The situation seemed bleak and it didn't help that his desk was right under the window. So his papers and his computer, everything was soaked. I was so nervous for him to come home and it wasn't until later that evening. And when he arrived home, I actually hid from him. And a few moments later, he found me. He said, Chris, come on out from there. And I remember being afraid, and I told him what happened. And his response really surprised me because it was not a typical uncle response. He said to me, I can see what you did, and I want you to know that I'm not mad. Wow. I apologized, and he actually forgave me. And that was my earliest memory of praying for something that really mattered to me. And my grandmother helped me to learn that prayer could transform the outcome of the situations in my life. I learned that day that prayer could be my lifeline. And when we devote ourselves to prayer, we begin to have that signature fragrance of Christ. It has the power to not only transform us, but it can transform the situations that we find ourselves in as well. You know, our hope for this series is that you would see that you are part of a life-giving, vibrant church, just like the early church in the book of Acts. There is life here is more than just our slogan. It's a declaration of God's goodness and his grace among us. A life-giving church is a praying church, and it's true. We are a church filled with people of prayer. I talked about prayer as a lifestyle, and I want to give you a few tips on how to begin to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer if you haven't yet. Start small and pray for five minutes in the morning. You can begin by redeeming the ordinary moments in your life. Pray while you're in the shower, while you're in the car, while you're making your kids' lunches. Give thanks and pray before you eat. You know, I actually took to praying for my kids when they wake me up in the middle of the night. Instead of getting angry, I just pray for them. It's awesome. You could even join, and then I might even fall asleep too. Come on. You know, you could even join us for Tuesday prayer. We have a corporate prayer meeting right in this room every Tuesday from 12 p.m. to 1245. It's such a powerful meeting. We've seen God answer all kinds of prayers, huge and small and everything in between. And if you can't make it in person, you can always watch it online from your office or while you're on your lunch break. And finally, when it comes to prayer, You need to know that you were never left on your own to figure it out. We're never left to our own devices to figure it out. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the one who died for us and was raised to the right hand of God, prays for us. And just a few verses before that, in 8.26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's good news, my friends. Even when we don't know what to pray, and even when we fail to pray, the Lord is interceding for us. He's praying for us. And the Spirit is praying for us with groanings too deep for words. And the amazing thing is that when we do pray, we are joining a concert of prayer that's already in progress. We're joining the Spirit and joining Christ Jesus as they intercede for each one of us. And as you leave this place today, my prayer for you is that you would see that prayer is a lifestyle centered on being with Jesus depending on him as your lifeline and sharing in his fragrance. And maybe today you're saying, you know what? I haven't started a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to offer you the opportunity to do the very thing today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you, maybe today is the day you want to start this relationship. You start a relationship with Jesus with a very simple prayer. It goes like this, sorry, thank you, and please. And I want to lead you through that prayer. 
if you're in this room today and no one's looking around and you want to start a relationship with Jesus, all I want to ask you is just shoot your hand up quickly. Yeah, thank you so much. Put your hand up. If you want to start a relationship with Jesus today, you want this peace that transcends understanding, you want to start a relationship with the one who created you and knows you and loves you, gave himself for you. I'll give you one more moment. Anyone that wants to put their hand up, no one's looking around. Yeah, thank you so much. So you can repeat this prayer in your heart, in your mind, or out loud with me. It's the sorry, thank you, and please. Jesus, I'm sorry for the wrongs that I've done. Thank you that you gave your life for me so that I could be free from my sin. Please, would you come into my life by your Holy Spirit? In your name I pray, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer today, all of heaven is celebrating with you. You've made the best decision you could ever make following Jesus with your life. It's powerful. And I want to encourage you, would you go to our next steps table? We have a little pamphlet for you that helps you take those next steps. We want to make sure that you feel supported in your journey with Jesus Christ. But I also want to pray for everyone else in this room, just to cap off this message. Why don't we pray one more time? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and also forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Meet us in the everyday moment of our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness. And I pray that you would be ever close to us by your spirit as we leave here today. God, we thank you that you can heal, you can provide, you can give us hope, you can give us a future. We thank you and we just pray that over each person in this room today. May they leave here with hope, peace, comfort, and joy. We thank you that you are good and you are faithful. In your name I pray, amen. Amen.